Time to talk about German armored trains during Operation Barbarossa. Be aware that the source situation is not the best here. Most sources are written by the same author. After all, it's a rather niche topic. In the previous campaigns, the Germans had used armored trains in a limited fashion. As so often, there were several reasons for this. That armored trains have played only a minor role so far has been due to not only to skepticism about their value, and previous deployments have done little to dispel this, but also to unclear lines of authority. The armored trains were equipped and manned by the inspectorate for railway pioneers, yet they were under the command of the army high command. Additionally, an armored train is quite high maintenance in several ways. Although it was operated by a rather small amount of troops, those troops were from many different arms. Savodny notes the infantry, artillery, flak, railway pioneer, signal, naval and medical arms. I must add here, I have no idea why the naval truppe, which usually operated naval office, included here. I suspect probably for detection of chemical agents, since that was also the job of the naval truppe. On top of that, he notes, incidentally, the technical crew of the armored train, a Reichsbahn inspector as technical leader, two locomotive drivers, three stokers, two track observers, and an engine and light technician, also a wagon foreman, were provided by the Deutsche Reichsbahn until the end of the war on request through the transport services at the Reichs Ministry of Transport. And as mentioned, the performance early in the war was limited. Saloga notes the following. The Wehrmacht again attempted to use armored trains briefly in the 1940 campaign to seize objectives in the Netherlands. But of the 10 armored train operations in Poland and the Netherlands in 1939 to 1940, only two were marginally successful. Two more armored trains were authorized in summer of 1940, reusing captured Polish and Czech components. Yet the role of armored trains would become more important during Operation Barbarossa. Those of you who know my video on why armored trains might know already. Anyway, let's move on. For Operation Barbarossa, each army group was assigned two armored trains. As many of you know, the railway gauge in the Soviet Union was different to that in Germany and Western Europe. It was broader. As such, these trains were converted to the broad gauge. Let us shortly look at the composition of such a train. Panzerzug 26 in June 1941 looked as follows. At the front was a regular empty flatbed car. These were generally used to detonate mines and also carry spare rails. It was followed by two cars, each with a Beutepanzer S35 Sumoa. Next was an infantry car, basically a low armored open top car with firing slits. Then there was a locomotive, and at this point the setup of the train is mirrored, although with one less car for carrying tanks. Note that some of the other trains had less tank and infantry cars, but the overall layout was similar. In some cases different locomotives were used as well. Be aware that the locomotives were initially not armored, but shortly before Operation Barbarossa started, plates were put on the driver's cabin. The officers commanding the trains had infiltrated the Soviet Union a few days before the invasion, disguised as train attendants on the various transport trains that exchanged goods between the German Reich and the Soviet Union. Let us look at operations next. Since there were some regions in the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states, and parts of Poland that had not been converted to the broad gauge yet, regular German armored trains could be used there as well. In the initial fighting, armored trains supported various combat operations. Probably one of the heaviest fighting was conducted by Panzerzug 29. Armored train 29 was able to cross unharmed the railway bridge over the Blug from Platerov in a coup de main on the morning of June 22nd and on the eastern bank. After clearing two camps with surprised Russians, it was able to capture Simitiake station and by surprise fire break up a Soviet column traveling unsuspectingly toward the Bug on a road running parallel to the railroad line. After that, the disembarked train crew was used to roll up the bunker line at Anusin, which did not go off without friendly casualties. Zaloga points out that the primary mission of German armored trains in the opening phase of the campaign was to seize keel rail bridges, where Savodny notes that various railway bridges were taken but without the use of armored trains. It could be that Savodny's information is outdated here, but unlikely considering the amount of research he has done and that he specifies the different formations that took the bridges. Be aware 
that the previously quoted actions were not representative, especially not for the upcoming operations in summer and fall 1941. Savodny notes that for this duration none of the armored trains was used directly at the front. The role was now a different one. The main task were to do reconnaissance of the tracks in the conquered areas, to secure them and to carry out restoration and regauge work, which soon became necessary since, contrary to original expectations, little broad gauge rolling stock was left serviceable by the Russians. To fight and capture enemy forces remaining in the rear during the rapid advance of their own fighting forces, especially in the course of the great encirclement battles in the central section, and to an ever increasing extent to provide transport security against the partisans who were already emerging. Be aware that data on most of the movements prior to November 1941 was lost according to Zavotny, although that statement is from 1996, so it might not be unlikely that new documents were found in the meantime. He also describes how one train, namely Panzerzug 28, operated. This train captured a Soviet armor train that was integrated, additionally it was assigned two reinforced infantry battalions, parts of a railway, railway pioneer company, a railway operations company and signal troops. After the Soviets had retreated and destroyed train stations, switches, signals and other railway infrastructure, the German armor train followed with an infantry platoon and railway engineers, while a transport train with other elements remained behind. Before breaks in the rail lines, the armored train stopped, the infantry platoon swarmed out for security and the pioneers took up the work of clearing disruption. The average time for this is given as two hours. The transport train, a locomotive with 37 freight cars, four of them for ammunition, on which were loaded six light infantry support guns and three anti-tank guns, moved up according to visibility. In case the distance to the next train station was limited, infantry on foot or bicycle was sent out to clear villages of enemies and prevent him from destroying equipment. In some cases reconnaissance was performed about 30 kilometers, so about 90 miles to the east. At the stations passed through, base crews in strength of one or two platoons were left behind, which also had to control the intervening lines. Note, a German infantry platoon at the time had an authorized strength of about 50 riflemen. Later in the war, namely in fall 1943, it was reduced to 31 men. For general understanding of German units, see this video on ranks. As mentioned, Panzerzug 28 has been assigned additional units to capture the railway lines between Kursk and Orel from 31st October to 3rd November 1941. The report pointed out various aspects. On the positive side, it is pointed out that the Kampfgruppe was composed appropriately for the length of the line and the number of stations to be occupied, that the necessary repairs were promptly made by railway engineers attached directly to the armored train, but for whose transportation internally armored freight cars are to be provided, and that all communications worked perfectly. The report also mentioned various problems with the armored train, particularly that not all weapons were operational and that there were not enough crews. Additionally, that the train could only drive during the day and good visibility with a speed of up to 15 km per hour, so about 9 miles per hour. For the transport train, it is mentioned that it was leaking, which meant that a lot of water was lost. This was even worse since there were no pumps to refill the train at various water bodies. As such, it was demanded to provide two functional locomotives, water and coal reserves, as well as pumps. Other elements were requested as well like cavalry platoon, a bicycle unit, vehicles for the anti-tank guns, mine detection troops, an anti-aircraft platoon, and floating rafts to cross river in case of destroyed bridges and some other stuff as well. Back to the general aspects of the campaign. Soon after the border was crossed, it became apparent that the number of broad gauge armored trains in service was insufficient for reconnaissance and protection of conquered route network. So captured Russian, Armored trains were soon put into service by the Germans for such purposes. Although there are several pictures, there is almost no documentary evidence of this. Soon, however, the captured material had to be handed over to the collection point of the German Army High Command. Additionally, there are also improvised armed or armored trains used by the various formations to secure the railway lines. For instance, by the 221st Security Division. Generally, German armored trains in this period of the war 
with the exception of the initial stages, were not used in regular combat at the front. Finally, it can be said that Operation Barbarossa clearly changed the German outlook on armored trains. As Saloga notes, Although the Wehrmacht had shown little enthusiasm for armored trains prior to 1941, after the war in Russia bogged down, the need for them became more evident and the German armored train force grew steadily through the course of the war. Railways were vital to supplying the Wehrmacht and the long stretches of railroad could not be economically defended using fixed defenses. Armored trains were extremely useful for protecting the railroads, as well as for rapidly deploying forces to deal with the ever-increasing partisan threat. Well, I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and subscribers. As always, there's a list in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.